the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the church which will not endure sound doctrine having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor Deschardins, Norman Winston Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the Apostate Church of the Book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called Martyrs and Saints? Question mark. <laughs> because there is a difference between martyrs and saints in our world today. You can be sure about that. And this is chapter 13 in the book All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian, where he analyzes the ecumenical movement, among other things. He goes back into interesting history, especially in this little chapter, which I found very interesting to read. It's today the 8th of uh, October and um, I read the German part before this and thought okay I'm still have an hour so before I have an appointment <coughs> with Tom Fress for my weekly Bible study so I th said uh, try to read this in before that. Martyrs and Saints We are living in a climate of increasing indifference towards our history. Yeah. That is the least that you can say about that. Indifference towards our history. Even uneducated towards our history. And I've said that years ago, when I still was with Walt Stickle, I said that the people today, the generations living today, the three or four generations that are on this world right now, are the ones who are the, more, the, the farthest away from God as any of the generations ever lived, probably. That's at least the way that I experience it. I don't know about you, but I think that God is in more than 90% of the world population something they can't even grasp what it is. And we are living in an increasing indifference towards our history because our history is not taught anymore. I tapa source he said that in his book Rulers of Evil that maybe the day will come when only amateurs are studying history to make sense of the past and try to make predictions for the future and understand the present. And he was absolutely right about that. You know, people believe today is what matters. Yesterday is not relevant. Though a lot of people know and say, well, history repeats itself, history repeats itself. So, but if you don't know history, what are you going to do with the knowledge that history repeats itself? The spirit of the age has turned us into what is now 
and what is new. That's the interesting, that's the only thing that counts. What is now and what is new. Having the latest iPhone, latest iPad, the latest smartphone, the latest this, the latest that, that's interesting. All the rest, as we say in Germany, Schnee von gestern, snow from yesterday, yesterday's news, it doesn't matter. Materialism, yeah, materialism and a comfortable life seduce us into the conviction that we have progressed and evolved as human beings. This illusion is being fed by television, today's household god, which is convincing us that we are in control of our planet and our destiny. I forgive the author for using the word planet on the, on the earth here in this case. I don't go into that. But this illusion is being fed by television, today's household god, or as Anton LaVey said it so very fitting, fittingly, the modern family, satanic family altar. That's the television. Our advance as a civilization is not only in expertise and technology, but also in our approach to religion too. The church has caught hold of this new dynamic. Perhaps from the world, the Lord is doing a new thing. Renewal has rescued the Christians from the past, from all the unpleasantness, the strife and the bloodletting. The old conflicts over doctrine are no longer relevant. No, 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 no. Those things which caused such division almost throughout the whole Christian era have absolutely no place on the agenda today. There is no need to think about them or to talk about them or to teach our children about them in school. It is divisive and unloving to do so. Resistance to Britain's Protestant Christian heritage aspects, of which are increasingly represented as offensive, is gathering strength. The 1988 year of anniversaries, during which Christians commemorated no fewer than ten important centen uh, centenaries and jubilees relating to the history of the English Bible was given very little coverage on television or in the national press, although Her Majesty the Queen began her 1988 Christmas message by stressing the importance to the nation of both 1588 and 1688 and spoke of how different our history would have been without the great events commemorated by the anniversaries. Now, who knows what happened 1588? Who knows what happened 1688? Maybe a few of my listeners here? 1588 was the invasion of the Spanish Armada. The Spanish invasion ordered by the Pope of Rome to make England Protestant again. And 1688 was the year of the Glorious Revolution. But who knows that today? One vital aspect of that heritage has been subtly undermined. Many of us were brought up to believe that the martyrs of our faith were those who died in the fire, unable and unwilling to compromise their trust in the scriptures as the revealed word of God. But in November 1987, in uncharacteristic fashion, the serious newspaper television and radio were giving prominent coverage to, quote, the honoring of English martyrs, unquote. Now it gets interesting. Many those attention, many whose attention had been captured by such headlines and whose imagination had been fired in the classroom by accounts of heroism of Cranmer, Latimer and Ridley must have been startled to discover that they refer to 85 Roman Catholic quote unquote, heroes of resistance to the Protestant Reformation. These men were beatified by the Pope in Rome in the presence of Anglican Bishop of Birmingham, Mark Santer. In a special message, Catholic Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Hume, said carefully, quote, the story of the martyrs must not be seen as an embarrassing episode, 
but must take its rightful place as an important part of our heritage. Unquote. Our heritage? The Roman Catholic heritage. It is likely that policymakers in Rome would be aware that only one Anglican bishop since the war, meaning the Second World War, has attended the memorial service for any of the martyrs of the Reformed faith. The lone exception was Dr. Chavassi, Bishop of Rochester, who attended the 400th anniversary commemoration of the martyrdom of Latimer and Ridley in, at Oxford in 1955. That already being almost 40 years before the finishing of this book. The caution that characterized previous beatifications and canonizations in Protestant countries is no longer necessary. The number of canonization processes has escalated dramatically during the last few years, including those carried out for the first time in history on foreign soil. In the single year 1982, for example, more causes were introduced than during the whole of the 1950s as we can read in Peter Hebblesweight in the Vatican, 1987. Antichrist Pope John Paul II, in 12 years of his papacy, raised to the altars more saints of the Church than all his predecessors of this century, the 20th, combined. He is planning even a new wave of canonizations, which include English Cardinals Newman and Manning as well, as Pope Pius XII and John XXIII. Now, are we talking here about martyrs or are we talking about traitors? That depends, of course, from your point of view. When you have the point of view of a Bible-believing Christian, then the martyrs that the Roman Catholic Church proclaims are martyrs are traitors and vice versa. So the question is, what point of view do you have? Martyrs or traitors? The distinction that Christians seek to make between Protestant and Catholic martyrs is best seen through the perspective that history provides. In a previous chapter, <coughs> In the previous chapter, mention has been made of those in the mission field today, as throughout Christian history, who unacknowledged and unsung are being martyred for the truth. In contrast, the media has given much coverage to the quote-unquote martyrdom of the six Jesuit priests of El Salvador who unquestionably were caught up in the political process at the time of their death. At the time of the extensive press coverage of the 1987 beatification of 85 English martyrs, the London-based United Protestant Council put out a well-researched release, part of which is reproduced here. I listen carefully when I'm going to read that. It went out to all the national newspapers, but nothing was printed in any of them. Now, listen to the long but interesting quote. No one who is concerned for historical truth can be satisfied with the claim by the Church of Rome that the 85 English subject, subjects that have been beatified by the Pope were martyrs, which means that they suffered for their faith alone. The 288 martyrs who were put to death during Mary's, Mary I's five years' reign suffered solely for their faith. They were condemned on purely religious charges, being principally that they refused the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is the belief that the bread and wine in the Mass are changed into the actual body and blood of Christ. They never denied that Mary was the lawful Queen of England, nor maintained any of her open or foreign enemies, nor procured any rebellion or civil war. They did not sow sedition in secret places, nor withdraw any subjects from their obedience. Such charges of treason, however, were legitimately brought against those Roman Catholics who were put to death 
under the reign of Elizabeth and succeeding monarchs and whose names are included in the recent list of those beatified by the Pope in Rome. No Roman Catholic was executed in the first 11 years of Elizabeth I's reign prior to the Pope Pius V's inciting all Roman Catholics to rebellion, commanding them not to obey her on pain of excommunication. It is an unchallengeable fact that no Roman Catholic was executed solely on account of his religious beliefs. The truth is that most of those laymen beatified were put to death for assisting the seminary priests in their design to bring down the throne. 63 out of the 85 English martyrs were seminary priests trained abroad and sent back to further the plots of the Pope to undermine the English throne. These had been stepped up by Pope Gregory VII's uh, sanctioning of the assassination of Elizabeth in 1580 and the organizing of invasion in 1588, the Spanish Armada, as I already told you. With this background in mind, it is impossible to agree that these men were martyrs in any proper sense of the word. On the contrary, what the Church of Rome is engaged in doing is glorifying traitors, spies and conspirators. End quote. I think it is a very important sentence. It is an unchallengeable fact that no Roman Catholic was executed solely on account of his religious beliefs. And I go even further. It is an unchallengeable fact that no Roman Catholic ever was execute, executed solely on account of his religious beliefs. Ever. Not in the time of British Reformation, not in the time of German uh, uh, Reformation, not anywhere at any time. Protestants, Bible-believing Christians, don't kill other people because they have another belief system. Oh, they put people to trial, yes, because they were, as it was said here, traitors, they were spies and they were conspirators, and they were trying to change what was perceived as a lawful government under the Bible, under God, under Protestant, um, under, uh, how do you say that, under Protestant and Bible-believing rules. Then people were executed, yeah, like the people who, who formed the gunpowder plot and, and other treasons, of course. Or in the United States of America, where you had uh, the hanging of the four people from the Surratt family who conspired to kill uh, President Abraham Lincoln, of course, they were executed because of the conspiracy and of the harm they did. But never, ever in a Protestant country was a Roman Catholic executed solely on account of his religious beliefs. On the other hand, Rome has killed millions and millions and millions of men, women and innocent children throughout the ages solely because of their account of their religious beliefs which was adhering to the Bible and to the Creator God and to Jesus Christ who died for the forgiveness of our sins at the cross. That is the big difference. So martyrs or traitors? Yeah. Think about that. And when you're a Roman Catholic, think very hard about that before you use the word martyrs for your Antichrist Church. You know, history is being rewritten, and this is the next part of the chapter 13, Martyrs and Saints, in the book. The same protest had been made over the 1970 canonization of 40 martyrs of England and Wales by Pope Paul VI. On that occasion, the saints had included Thomas Garnet and Michael Owen. 
uh, sorry, and Nicholas Owen, two of the conspirators in the notorious gunpowder plot of 1605. Now, if you don't know what the gunpowder plot of 1605 is, then do your own research. And if you want to know, I did a broadcast on um, Hour of the Truth uh, about um, Reformation Day last year, 2014, 2015, dealing with Reformation Day and dealing with the gunpowder plot, because that's only a few days after that. Look it up. Do your own studies. We're going a little bit into that right here. But otherwise, I can only advise you to watch that video and do your own research. With Protestantism on the ropes, the process of rewriting the history of our country is gathering pace. Well, <laughs> the Americans can sing a song of that also. And we Germans, oh wow. The Discovery Pack. Marketed by Marshall Cavendish, first sold to millions of young people in 1988 and since then remarketed as a game, portrays Guy Fawkes as a young idealist, unswervingly loyal to the Roman Catholic faith, who endured persecution at the hands of his accusers. He too may well be beatified or even canonized before long. A cryptic letter to the Daily Telegraph on the 1st of November 1989 from J. G. Lynch of Middlelothian, headed, quote, burning insult, unquote, asked if the BBC had added a new feast to the church calendar, quote, after songs of praise on the 29th of October 1990, we were invited to join in again next Sunday in songs of praise for bonfire night, St. Guy Fawkes, unquote. The canonization of Thomas Henry Garnet as one of the 40 martyrs illustrates perhaps better than anything just how far things have gone in our lifetime. The gunpowder plot was a Jesuit conspiracy to blow up king and parliament, which was to lead to an armed rising against the monarchy. Garnet, who was superior of the Jesuits in England at that time, confessed to this guilt and was hanged for his participation in this most terrible of crimes. His confession, written in his own hand, is still preserved in the public record office. And before I'm going to read that to you, you have to know that there is also a movie out there which is called uh, V for Vendetta, when you watch that, you will not get the right picture of Guy Fawkes, of course. But you will have the fictional picture the Roman Catholic Church paints on that. And that's why Hollywood movies are always that dangerous, believe me. But quote from what uh, Garnett wrote. I, Henry Garnett of the Society of Jesus, priest, do freely confess before God that I hold the late intention of the powder action to have been altogether unlawful and most horrible, as well in respect of the injury and treason to his majesty, the prince, and others that should have been sinfully murdered at that time, as also in respect of infinite other innocents which should have been present. I do acknowledge myself highly guilty to have offended God, the King's Majesty and Estate, and humbly ask of all forgiveness, exhorting all Catholics whatsoever that they in no way build on my example, but by prayer and otherwise seek the peace of the realm, hoping in His Majesty's merciful disposition that they shall enjoy their wonted quietness and not bear the burden of mine or others' defaults and crimes. In testimony hereof, I have written this with my own hand on 4th of April, 1605. This is signed. Well, the date cannot be 4th of April, 1605, because the gunpowder plot took place on the 5th of November, 1605. <coughs> so this confession would have been seven months before that, so I don't believe that. But he was caught in March 1606 and uh, executed on the 3rd of May 1606. So I guess it is quite um, 
<laughs> accepting to say that this was the 4th of April 1606 that he signed this, and this is a, a printing error. But the same printing error appeared, of course, in the German version, so I'm just going to tell you the 4th of April 1605 is impossible, because he couldn't have done that seven months before the gunpowder plot. Anyway, it's not about the date, it's about what he says here. It's about what happened at that time. The portrait of Henry Garnet, saint and martyr of the Roman Catholic faith, certainly until recently, has for a long time been hanging in the hall of the Jesuits College in Rome. Also recently canonized among the forty martyrs was Jesuit Edmund Campion, who in 1580 was found guilty of conspiracy to depose and kill the Queen, to cause war, slaughter, and insurrection and to change religion and government and to call in foreign enemies. He was executed for these crimes. Campion was canonized by the Antichrist, Pope Paul VI, in 1970. Martyrs and saints, martyrs or traitors. What I just described to you from Jesuit Edmund Campion, conspiracy to depose and kill the Queen, cause war, slaughter and insurrection, and to change religion and government, and to call in foreign armies, what is that to you? Is that the deed of a martyr, or is that the deed of a traitor? Another controversial canonization was that of Thomas More back in 1935. He was established as a heroic figure in the public mind by influential Catholic writers such as Hilaire Belloc and Evelyn Waugh, as well as by G. K. Chesterton, who described him as, quote, the greatest historical character in English history, unquote. His portrayal by Robert Bolt in the film A Man for All Seasons firmly established Moore as one of the great men of faith of his time or of any other time. But this is fantasy, not history. Like V for Vendetta. In his well-known 1982 book The Statesman and the Fanatic, historical author Jasper Ridley reveals Moore as a fanatic and one, quote, who stood for the opposite of everything that he is admired for today. He may not have flocked heretics in his garden, but there was nothing that more, that more, more strongly disapproved of than freedom, individual conscience, and religious toleration. In fact, heretics were flocked in his garden. Now, the use of the word heretic, the author gives us a little footnote. The use of the word heretics without the inverted commas or quotation marks referring to true Christians is typical of our time. The Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church under the heading Smithfield has this short and dismissive entry. Quote, the place in London noted formerly as the site of executions, especially during the Reformation period, when in the fires of Smithfield during Mary Tudor's reign about 300 heretics were burned there. It is now famous as a meat market." Unquote. So, in fact, heretics were flocked in the garden of Thomas More. Wiley's History of Protestantism and Fox's Acts and Monuments, or better known as Book of Mar Fox's Book of Martyrs, immensely important reading for Christians today, describe the scourging and torture of those guilty of studying the scriptures and holding purely Protestant doctrines, including John Tewkesbury, a trader, and James Bainham, a lawyer, at the Tree of Truth in Sir Thomas More's garden. Who knows today? James Edgar Wiley's History of Protestantism, three volumes thick edition. And who knows? that wonderful work from John Fox, Acts and Monuments. That was obligatory reading, compulsive, I mean, 
uh, is compulsive the right word? I don't know. You had to read that, <laughs> let's say it like this, uh, in the beginning and even until the middle of the last century in schools in America. I know that from an American friend who told me that. That was taught that time. It is not taught anymore. Who knows? James Edkin Wiley's History of Protestantism and Fox's Book of Martyrs today. On the 24th of January 1935, the Protestant Truth Society sent the following telegram to Pope Pius XI, who was at that time presiding over the Canonization Council, justifying the raising to sainthood of Sir Thomas More and Bishop John Fisher. Quote, Vienna, Charles V and Henry VIII States Papers, 27th of September, 1533, disclose Bishop Fisher a traitor, planning Spanish invasion of England. Shall we send copies of State Papers before you proceed further with the canonization on 29th of January? Unquote. <laughs> what do you think the response was? After some courteous correspondence in which the Vatican received photocopies of the papers made by the British Public Record Office, the facts were sent to the Press Association. Now listen. Only two newspapers published them. The Daily Herald and the News Chronicle. It is interesting to notice that neither of those two newspapers is published today. First ecumenical saint, J. H. Newman. With characteristic fine timing, the cause for sainthood of Cardinal John Henry Newman was presented to the Pope in July 1989, even as an Anglo-Catholic campaign to make him an Anglican saint gathered momentum in the centenary of his death. Clifford Longley's opinion in the Times that, quote, Newman certainly wrote the agenda of the Second Vatican Council from the grave, unquote, has had backing from more than one Pope by whom he has been credited with inspiring what is often called the Newman's Council. Newman's cause for sainthood has been getting top priority at the Vatican, according to his postulator Jesuit father Vincent Blell. He has already been pronounced venerable, the first stage of the three-part process. He does still lack a physical miracle accredited to him normally needed for the second stage of beatification. But the Pope is expected to make an exception because of the quote-unquote the moral miracle of his exceptional spiritual influence. We are talking about Newman, right? So I looked it up in Wikipedia, and I will provide the link to the Wikipedia in the description box of this video, where it reads, In 1991, Newman was proclaimed a venerable by Pope John Paul II, we already knew that, after a thorough examination of his life and work by the Sacred Congregation for the Causes of Saints. One miracle was investigated and confirmed by the Vatican, so he was beatified on the 19th of September 2010 by Antichrist Pope Benedict the 16th. A second miracle is necessary for his canonization. Now, let me tell you this. When they say that this Cardinal Newman is the spiritual father of the Second Vatican Council, which is now 50 years over, and we are now in the Jubilee year 2016 and ap approaching the 500-year Jubilee of the Reformation in 2017, I am quite sure that within the next 12 to 15 months, this Cardinal Newman will probably be canonized. My opinion not the authors. John Henry Newman, whose reputation is growing rapidly in the climate of unity, seems certain to emerge as the first ecumenical saint. 
The centenary of his death in 1990 was commemorated and his life celebrated by the church and given a great deal of media coverage. Thomas Cranmer's quincentenary, by comparison, made little impact on the nation. Newman is particularly remembered for his attempt to reconcile the Council of Trent with the 39 Articles of the Church of England. Cranmer, author of the 39 Articles, devoted his life to highlighting the differences between the teaching of Rome and the biblical doctrine of the National Church. As director of the Church of England's Church Society, David Samuel said at that time, quote, It is not at all surprising, therefore, that the former Newman should be as much fettered as the latter Cranmer neglected. Unquote. Newman, whose reformulation of doctrine was particularly praised by former Archbishop of Canterbury Robert Runcy, believed that developing that developing doctrine is really synonymous with continuing revelation, a view shared in many stands of charismatic and liberal thought today. Dr. Runcy expressed his belief that, quote, after conflicts had come a miracle, unquote. Newman had been the instrument in fashioning that miracle, and this meant that he was increasingly seen as a representative figure in the 19th century history of the Church. Times have certainly changed. 19th century statesman William Gladstone, also a high churchman, saw Newman's conversion to Rome as, a pos as possibly the greatest religious crisis since the Reformation, for the Protestant Church, of course. Although now less visible, that crisis of which the future Prime Minister spoke had deepened as reformulated doctrine has spread and the ecumenical process has accelerated. Certainly a considerable debt is owed to Newman's developing doctrine by those who helped put together the agreed statements of the ARCIC. Uh, that is the Anglican Roman Catholic uh, Church in, uh, Interfaith uh, Community. His essay on the development of Christian doctrine, a uniquely ecumenical work which he started as an Anglican and completed as a Roman Catholic, has been a proof text for all involved. An examination of Newman's life and thought has been described by bemused Protestant scholars as an experience, quote, amid the encircling gloom, unquote, but without the kindly light to lead them. Such a reflection is not to make mockery of Newman's famous hymn, Lead Kindly Light, but to express something of what has been found among the output of a torturous, complex and contradictory mind. One of his oldest friends, Dr. Jelf, said that Newman's mind was always essentially Jesuitical and fellow Roman Catholic Lord Acton described him as a manipulator, manipulator of the truth. As leader of the Tractarian Society, which was characterized by its secret, uh, secretiveness, he had defended what was called economy in teaching and arguing, setting out the truth advantageously or withholding it. Quoting Clement of Alexandria, Newman wrote, quote, He both thinks and speaks the truth, except where careful treatment is necessary, and then, as a physician for the good of his patients, he will lie. Nothing but the good of his neighbor will lead him to do this. He gives himself up for the church. A true believer gives himself up for Jesus Christ. Economy was one term to describe this means to an end doctrine of the Jesuits. Reserve was another. Means to an end means the end justifies the means. That's the point. Economy was one term to describe this the end justifies the means doctrine of the Jesuits and reserve was another. 
The doctrine of economy or reverse was used to conceal much of the ritualistic movement of the 19th century, including the membership, objectives and activities of the Oxford movement and Tractarian society. Protestant watchman Walter Walsh has carefully researched all of this in his book The Secret History of the Oxford Movement, which includes information about the conf uh, confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament that <coughs> set up to reintroduce the doctrine of transubstantiation, the guild of all souls, to bring back purgatory and prayers for the dead and the order of corporate union to plant the seeds of ecumenical unity with Roman and Orthodox churches. Sainthood and the British Crown is the last but one part of chapter 13, which we are dealing with in the book All Roads Lead to Rome, Martyrs and Saints. When Newman became most famous oh sorry when Newman became Britain's most famous convert to Rome in 1845 his confession prior to his confirmation was heard by George Spencer known as Father Ignatius Spencer of St Paul who also acted at his as his sponsor great 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 uncle to Princess Diana as well as great uncle to Sir Winston Churchill and convert to Rome in 1830, just before the start of the Oxford movement. That was 1833. Funny how all these people hang together, right? Father Spencer is now in line for sainthood. The prominence of the publicity shown in, Vatic uh, in uh, the Vatican announcement of the causes presentation speaks volumes about its significance. As Father Jeremiah Donovan, like George Spencer, a passionist, <coughs> a passionate priest, told the Sunday Tel Telegraph, which we can read on the Sunday Telegraph on the 14th of April 1991, quote, Rome will be keen to have a saint linked to the British royal family. What? Rome will be keen to have a saint linked to the British royal family. Yeah, you heard right. As is argued elsewhere in this book, this is surely an understatement. The canonization is likely, like Newman's, to go through its three stages very quickly. The record for elevation to sainthood is 352 days, meaning less than one year achieved by Saint Anthony of Padua in the 13th century. Such speed would obviously draw attention to itself, but things are moving fast. In his enthronement speech to the multi-faith congregation at Canterbury Cathedral on 19th of April 1991, Archbishop of Canterbury George Carey revealed his own strong ecumenical commitment in speaking of his predecessors as archbishops who had been martyred for their faith. He cited Alphege, Thomas Beckett and William Lord and omitted Thomas Cranmer. Alphege was a 10th century Benedictine monk. Beckett and Lord in the 12th and 17th century both sought to bring the church the Roman Catholic Church, the, 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 the Anglican Church, into the faith and practice under the authority of Rome. Alphege and Becket are saints of the Roman Catholic Church. It may well be that Lord, the ritualist who persecuted Protestants, is destined to join them soon. Although George Carey's enthronement committed him to upholding the 39 Articles of Religion and the Book of Common Prayer, it is significant that among the martyrs of the faith that he cited, he did not include the man most responsible for these principal formulas of the Anglican Church, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, a Protestant, a real saint. Not to forget, in the Bible, saints are the living, and dead people are not to be venerated at all. 
But Thomas Cranmer, Thomas Cranmer was a saint while he was living for what he did for Jesus. Saint Thomas Becket and the National Church. The tomb of Thomas Becket in Canterbury Cathedral and the spiritual presence of this saint of the Roman Catholic Church in the principal Anglican Cathedral is proving to be important for the ecumenical movement. In 1982, Antichrist Pope John Paul II and Archbishop Runcie prayed together at, this sh at his shrine, and in 1989, Archbishop of York John Habgood led pilgrims who had arrived for the first multi-faith gathering at the cathedral into the shrine as their final destination. The three strands of this fully ecumenical pilgrimage had earlier converged at the place, another sacred site, where Henry II had paid penance to the Pope following Becket's murder in 1170. Anglo-Catholic T.S. Eliot's murder in the cathedral, in the same way as A Man for All Seasons, in respect of Thomas More, has greatly altered the public perception of what brought about the death of this Catholic hero of faith. Services are now held annually across the country on 29th of December to commemorate Beckett's martyrdom with extensive coverage in the national media. Ah yeah, we are living in a climate of increasing and indifferent towards our history. We see history the way they painted and not the way it happened, because we are not taught real history anymore. Services are now held annually across the country on 29th of December to commemorate Beckett's martyrdom with extensive coverage in the national media. Beckett's martyrdom, which stemmed from his preferred allegiance to the papacy rather than the crown, or the Bible for that matter, may well prove to be important in the near future in the revival of the principle that the state should not have power over the church. The great national debate about what not long ago was the longest word of many, a schoolboy anti-disestablished... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is really a nice word. <laughs> the great national debate about what not long ago was the longest word of many a schoolboy, anti-disestablishmentarianism. Jeez. Anti-disestablishmentarianism, so that's it, is surfacing again in a new form. <laughs> Excuse me, but this is really a very difficult word. Anti-disestablishmentarianism. Now I got it. <laughs> a number of trial balloons have been <coughs> going up over the last few years and the British public has been prepared to seriously consider what was unthinkable less than a decade ago. Anti-disestablishmentarianism. Well, I think I'm going to put this word in written in the video that you can try to read it for yourself. <laughs> In the small letters in the book, even more complicated than in big letters on the screen, I can tell you. Anyway, okay. I'm sorry, but really. Okay, no, now I really got it. Anti-disestablishmentarianism. I got it now. <laughs> At the beginning of 1989, the Bishop of Aston raised the question of the disestablishing of the Church of England just a year after the Sunday Times in its leader modernized the monarchy had pointed out that, quote, ending the Protestant monopoly of the throne would not only be just, it would also free the Church of England of its cruel burden as the established church, unquote which you can read in Sunday Times, 31st of January, 1988, under the banner or the headline, Modernize the Monarchy. Yeah. Such continuing speculation has led to a serious national discussion about church and state, crown and mitre, in the wake of the Annus Horribilis of the royal family and the apparently irretrievable breakdown of the marriage of the heir to the throne, 
Archbishop of York, Dr. John Hapgood, appearing, uh, appearing on BBC Television's Heart of the Matter in January 1993 in a far-from-balanced programme apparently promoting disestablishment, raised the question of the coronation service. Quote, If this is to unify the nation, it must recognize that we now live in an ecumenical and multi-faith society, unquote, he said. Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, was quick to endorse his deputy's view. Quote, the religious map of Britain has changed out of the recognition and we have to look at that. Unquote. As published in the Daily Mail, February 1st, 1993. Now, constitutional experts believe... <coughs> that widening the scope of the oath would effectively mean the disestablishing of the Church of England as we know it, as we now know it. As columnist and author Paul Johnson put it, quote, There is no halfway house, no resting place between having an established church and turning Britain into a secular society, unquote. With the Maastricht process also threatening the Protestant throne, the breath the breathtaking speed in which these changes are taking place is seen by Christians as the withdrawal of the grace and blessing of God, the inevitable result of our national apostasy. And you Americans can write that all over your head the same way. The departure of the present royal family from their solemn oath, sworn to Almighty God before the nation at the ascension, at the, access, uh, at the accession, sorry, as well as to one another in holy matrimony, would seem after forty years to have reaped a whirlwind much more than an annus horribilis. Horrible year, that means in English. Her Majesty committed herself to upholding, to the utmost of her power, the statutes and laws of Scripture the royal law and the very oracles of God as well as the Protestant Reformed religion. During the forty years of her reign, the royal assent has been given to legislation facilitating divorce, legalizing abortion and homosexuality, sodomy, and liberating adultery and pornography. Very biblical what the Queen did in forty years of her reign, right? So, according to her oath, right? The collapse of Prince Charles's marriage following his affair with Camilla, wife of Colonel Andrew Parker Bowles, who is silver uh, who is silver stick in waiting to Her Majesty the Queen, has helped to precip precipitate the constitutional crisis and to encourage calls to change the oath. Apart from taking advice on constitutional matters from Roman Catholic Lord St. John of Falsley, the royal family must have been influenced by their very close friendships with Roman Catholics in their attitude towards Protestant vows which are sworn. The Parker Bowles family is hello, Catholic, as is James Gilby of the Diana Gate or Squiggity telephone tape. Princess Diana, much influenced by her spiritual report with Mother Teresa, hello, what spirit did she have then? And perhaps also with her, quote, favorite clairvoyant, Irish Roman Catholic psychic Betty Palco, unquote, is taking instruction from a Dominican priest to convert to the Roman Catholic faith at a secret Oxford address reported the tabloid press. Newspaper Today, 19th of December 1992 and The People, 27th of December the same year. If these reports are true, the princess, once converted, may well ask the Pope for an annulment to her marriage, based on the infidelity of Prince Charles at the time of their wedding and their exchange of vows. This would create a constitutional crisis that would very likely assist the ambitions of Rome. Sir William Heseltine, 
Australian former private secretary to the Queen, who was responsible for the 1969 BBC television documentary that first lifted the veil behind which the royal family had traditionally hidden itself, has been Her Majesty's closest advisor for these matters for many years. I do not doubt that this Sir William Heseltine is probably a Jesuit. The 1st February 1993 edition of the Daily Telegraph printed the coronation oath alongside news of the two archbishops' recommendation for its revision. The court circular on that, time, on that same day was mainly concerned with the representation of the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh and their sons, the three royal princes, at the state funeral of the former Governor-General of Canada, held at the Mary Queen of the World Cathedral in Montreal. And this finishes chapter 13 of All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael the Semlian, the chapter called Martyrs or Saints. I think this was quite intense. And I get chapter, f I, I guess, chapter 14 which is called Persecution and the Inquisition, will be even more intense. I'm very much looking forward to it. I thank you very much for your attention, your watching, your listening, your commenting, and, of course, your support that this ministry of Hour of the Truth can continue in preaching the truth of the Bible to the world and the forgotten Protestant belief system of today. Jogler 66 from Mower of the Truth says, God bless you, signing off and bye bye. We, as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government that is behind the European Union government and that is behind all the armies in the world and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world like XE or formerly called Blackwater run by Knights of Malta etc etc so this is something that you really have to understand this is all just a theater and the point is where is this theater going to lead to when you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, Take that information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people, that they maybe have a chance. By going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord 
to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.